Good evening, everyone. You can take your seats and we will get started. For those of you who purchased books ahead of time, we appreciate that, but I know that Dan will be willing to um, sign books after the, after the program as well, if you want to purchase from that, so thank you. So thank you for coming out tonight to the Flint Library. We're so happy to have you here. I would like to, as always, thank our friends organization, our volunteer organization who helps make events like this possible uh, by fundraising, by providing um, refreshments. So I just want to say very, thank you very much to the friends. So tonight we have a very special guest. Um, we like to support local authors when we can, and we do get a lot of requests from local authors to come in, and we look at what they write and try to see if it would be of interest to the community. And I got a call from Dan and said, okay, please look at this book, and I live in North Reading, and there's something you might be interested in. So before I called him back, we looked into the book and said, well, this is a great, great, great story. We'd love to talk to him. He sounded really nice on the phone. I, <laughs> I called him, and I get the machine that says, if you got this message, it's because I don't want to talk to you, so please go away. So, so I left the message, well, that was really harsh. <laughs> so that's how we first started our relationship, um, how we started to get to know each other, but I have since got to know Dan, great guy, super interesting story that I think you're all going to love, and he's a great storyteller and a great guy. So please welcome our North Reading resident, his first book, Shots in the Dark. Please welcome Dan Zimmerman. I just want to thank um, Sharon Keller and the, and the folks here at the uh, Flint Library for uh, inviting me here tonight to, uh, to share my story. Uh, a lot of you have read it already. A lot of you are getting ready to read it, as I could tell at the table here with, with the interest. Um, and I hope everybody enjoys it. It's, it's a, a good story, but a sad story, as you'll see as, as you read the book. Um, Rocco Bolero uh, was accused of a crime that he didn't commit back in the early 60s, uh, spent the next 50 years in prison, except for several times that he managed to take a little break from prison. Um, he did, he always ended up back there. Um, and so I decided to write this story, and the reason I decided to write the story is because I grew up with it. Um, when this uh, incident took place back in 1963, I was two. So obviously I don't remember it, too young to remember it, but I do remember a lot of the stories that my family uh, shared with me over the years about this, this character, Rocco Bolero. And the stories that were shared with me had more to do with a cold-blooded killer who murdered my aunt, who was 21, and murdered my cousin, who was two. So when I decided to write this book about eight or 10 years ago, uh, my first approach was I was going to write a story about a cold-blooded killer named Rocco Bolero. Uh, I went through a research phase. I talked to a lot of relatives, a lot of people who knew things about what took place. And it wasn't until I actually reached out to Rocco in prison, requested a visit, and the opportunity to speak with him, it wasn't until then that I discovered that I was totally wrong, and so was my family. Uh, it turns out that Rocco wasn't guilty of this crime. He was just a, uh, in the wrong place at the wrong time and that he didn't kill anybody. He actually loved my aunt and my cousin. They were his family, as he would describe them. Uh, so my approach to the book obviously had to take a, a, a total turn, and that's what I went after uh, over the, the next uh, seven or eight years. It was, it was a long process uh, to write this book. As you can see, 450 pages, 50 years of material, awful lot of people I spoke with over the years, and. Uh, uh, this is the end result, and I, I hope you folks enjoy it. So what we're going to do tonight, I'm going to um, have a brief agenda. I won't, I won't bore you to death. Michael, if you do get bored, the window's in the back. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> um, as you saw with the sign on the desk, any of these book sales, if you're familiar in North Reading, there's a, a family that's down on their luck a little bit. Um, a young woman lost her husband years ago, and she's raising two autistic children and her, her home is in jeopardy. So um, when I saw that on the North Reading community page, I decided to uh, contribute any proceeds to that family. So we're gonna do that. Um, right, the money goes right into that. 
there's, there's a method to my, my madness. I'm new to this town. I'm, I've only lived here for a couple of years. And prior to that, I spent 50 years in Norwood. Um, so it was kind of a, you know, kind of strange to move here and start to learn a new town and get to meet people and, and learn my way around. And I, I've discovered over the last couple of years that this is a great community and, and, and I'm doing my small part to help. So, um, Sharon introduced me. I'll just give you a quick biography of myself so you know a little bit of who I am. Um, I was born in Boston, only there for a few years. Moved to Norwood, as I said, spent most of my time in Norwood, and then later moved up to, uh, to North Reading to be closer to, uh, my, to my family, my daughter, and my grandchildren. Um, I have two. And the, the dedication is to them, if you've seen the dedication. Uh, I'm very proud of them, to, to have uh, this book dedicated to my, my two little cherubs. Um, so I kind of delved into, oh, and my writing background, just so you know. Um, I write for, I've written for a series of newspapers for the last 19, almost 20 years, uh, mostly high school sports, uh, but I have branched out a little bit. I've done a lot of profiles on athletes, but with that, you still have to develop your interview skills. You have to draw things out of them to be able to tell their story. And with high school kids, that's, that's a real challenge, so I got a lot of practice um, before I started to interview folks for this book. Um, so I told you a little bit about why I wrote the story. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm going to read a, a section from the book, and then I'm going to give you a few backroom stories that you don't see in the, in the book. Everybody seems to like those. And then uh, I'll open it up to some questions. So let me put on my uh, PJ's readers. If this gets really boring, please tell me and I'll stop. <laughs> I've heard tell uh, other authors who, uh, who do readings from books, uh, it's not usually welcome in these environments. Um, but I found this passage to be one of my favorites. I love writing it, and I love reading it. Can you want me to turn the pages for you? No, Mike, I can do that. Thank you, though. I appreciate it. <laughs> All right, this is kind of late in the book. And, and for those of you who have just bought it and haven't read it, um, I'm not going to give away a lot of the story by reading this. It's just a, a pretty exciting segment, and it tells a lot about Rocco Bolero and his capabilities when it came to eluding the police. Uh, unfortunately, in this case, he wasn't able. There's a tie-in on this. Uh, after I read it, I'll explain. Um, am I loud enough for everybody in the back? Yeah. I'm good? Yeah. Okay. On the television, Ed Sullivan was cracking jokes for a studio audience. The volume was too low for Rocco to hear, but he wasn't much interested. What did catch his attention, however, was the sound of activity in the street below. It was unmistakably car doors slamming shut, lots of them. Rocco's heart sank like a ship's anchor to the sea bottom. No, it can't be, he thought, with growing alarm. Suddenly, he was sweating profusely. He rose from the couch and made his way over to the window facing out to Chestnut Street. Rocco turned to see if Jeanette and the girls had heard him get up. They remained in the kitchen, out of sight. With a trembling hand, he grasped, grasped the thin sheer curtain framing the window and pulled it aside several inches, taking great care not to reveal himself to those outside. Leaning slightly forward to get a better look, his suspicions were confirmed. He froze, spellbound by the gripping exhibition unfolding on the street below. Anthony? Startled, he released the curtain and spun around. Jeanette was standing behind him. What's the matter, she asked. Deep concern overspread her pretty face. The whole effing Chelsea police force is out there. He hissed through clenched teeth. Jeanette, now joined by Joanna and Mary, turned pale with fear but said nothing. The trio, their faces drawn, remained silent as Rocco risked another look. Jesus, he moaned, his throat hoarse and raspy as dread firmly took hold. There's got to be a hundred cops out there. Anthony, I'm so sorry, Jeanette stammered. Tears were forming in her eyes. For what? Helen. Who? Helen, she repeated. That bitch I kicked out of here. She must have recognized you and called the police. Jeanette, it turned out, hit the nail on the head. The shunned woman had, in fact, tipped off the cops. An unidentified woman called Chelsea Police Headquarters and told patrolman Henry Kiatowski, if you want Rocco Bolero, come here now, wrote reporter Robert Bassett for the morning edition. It's 219 Chestnut Street. Bolero was here. Then she hung up. With only minutes to spare, Rocco sprang to action. 
He had to protect the girls. Listen up, he insisted. He circled the coffee table. The three young women remained speechless, their faces pale with fear. Look, girls, the cops will say you was hiding me. I'm going to tell you that I was holding, I'm going to tell them I was holding you hostage. Stick to that story, okay? At the base of the staircase, there was a dreadful commotion. The police were assembling. There was no attempt made by the contingent to mask their imminent approach. Jeanette broke her silence, but Anthony, what? She began, but he cut her short. Just do as I say, he shouted above the din of the gathering storm at the base of the stairs. I'll take the heat. The cops had begun to file up the staircase, their heavy combat boots thudding loudly against the wooden steps. Muffled voices resonated from behind the apartment walls, closing fast. There was also, Rocco noted with a shudder, the telltale metallic clicking sound as the lawmen chambered shotguns with deadly shells. Rocco brandished his 45 caliber and disengaged the safety. Unlike the night he encountered Clifford on the icy roads of Roxbury, when he had just two bullets to work with, his weapon was now fully loaded. Jeanette looked warily at the gun. Hostages, right? He asked as he popped the clip and examined the contents. Capiche? The girls nodded in unison. An instant later, all hell broke loose. A police officer kicked in the door, which splinted off the hinges and slammed violently against the inner wall. Shattered shards of wood flew in all directions. Several plainclothes policemen, guns drawn, swarmed into the apartment like a wave of angry hornets. I didn't know about the hornets when I wrote it. <laughs> That's a coincidence. Um, sorry. Uh, but the cagey jailbreaker they saw it had already fled, bolting from the room. He sprinted through the kitchen and burst through another egress that led to an exterior porch at the rear of the triple-decker. The cops hurriedly pursued, led by veteran Chelsea Lawman, later identified as Captain Robert Renfro. He dashed through the apartment with shotgun lowered, ready to blast away. In the distant background, babies were wailing. The assault on the apartment had woken Jeanette McDonough's children. Bolero, this is the police, Renfro shouted. Rocco realized he was hopelessly trapped. The only means to escape the cramped porch he quickly discovered was to leap over a three-foot picket fence. Feasible, certainly, but the building was surrounded by heavily armed police. Surely there were officers positioned somewhere in the alley below who would pounce once he reached the ground. That was after he sustained broken bones on impact with the asphalt surface. Detecting another door to his left, Rocco reached for the knob and gave it a twist. It was a storage closet, unlocked and filled with mops, brooms, and other cleaning materials. He quickly ducked inside and closed the door behind him. It was pitch black in the, inside the tiny space. Holding his breath, Rocco listened intently. Within seconds, the unmistakable sound of thudding boots could be heard on the porch, inches away. The fugitive was out of sight, but cornered. There was no way to run. Closing his eyes tightly, Rocco hastily weighed his options. There were two. He could burst out of the broom closet and go down shooting in a final deadly act of defiance or he could give up and let the courts decide his fate. Feeling around in the darkness, Rocco sought the one item that might save his life. His hand came upon a piece of cloth, which he glimpsed just before pulling the, pulling the door shut. Drawing a deep breath, he opened the closet door several inches and extended his hand outward. In it, he waved a white rag of surrender. For a second, he braced, half expecting a cop with an itchy trigger finger to blow his hand off. Rocco later found out that he had good reason to worry. The Chelsea police who were dispatched to apprehend the wanted man were issued to shoot, shoot to kill orders. The dragnet would take him dead or alive, and they were armed to the teeth, prepared to wage a mini war in the quiet urban neighborhood, if necessary. According to newspaper accounts, police hardware included assorted shotguns, carbines, carbines submachine guns, and gas bombs. If their quarry so much as flinched, it would have cost him his life. Rocco wasn't aware of it at the time, but tensions amongst the, the Chelsea police contingent were taut following a tragic event that occurred little, literally hours before. In nearby Boston, 46-year-old police patrolman James B. O'Leary was shot and killed during a foot pursuit of several liquor store robbery suspects. The death of their brother in the line of duty still freshly imprinted on their minds, these Chelsea police officers were taking no chances with the apprehension of the escape artist. <coughs> All right, Bolero, come out of there now, barked Renfro, who was stationed several feet from the meager hiding place. Easy, Rocco responded. He tried to swallow, but was unable. His constricted throat was completely parched. Don't shoot. I'm going to slide my gun out, okay? Do it slowly. Don't try anything stupid. Stooping down inside the closet, Rocco edged the door open wider, 
placed the 45 caliber handgun flat on the wooden porch surface. He gave the weapon a little shove with his, with his fingertips, sliding it towards the waiting police officers. He then stood upright and slowly emerged into the open to find several scowling uniformed men glaring at him. Each was aiming a shotgun at his midsection. Just so you know, on the cover of the book, the gentleman to Rocco's left is Renfro. This picture was taken um, during a press conference that was held after this apprehension of Rocco. He was a, I guess you could say a celebrity. Uh, everybody wanted him, especially the police. Uh, so there were news channels there. When this picture was taken, there were uh, scores of reporters, cameras clicking, news channels. Uh, everybody, uh, it was on the TV that night that they finally captured Rocco Bolero. So that's, that's my, uh, my segment. Everybody enjoy it? Oh, yeah. All right, before we move to the questions, which I'm really looking forward to, um, I have a few side stories. Everybody, like I said earlier, really enjoys these, and I hope you do too. I'll try to keep them as brief as, as I can. Um, when I was researching this book, obviously I had to reach out to um, an assorted uh, police agencies, government agencies, to get records, reports of things that took place. And one of the key events in this book had to do with a, an arrest of Rocco Bolero and an associate um, as they were uh, ferrying a truckload of stolen fur coats down to Providence. They were fencing, <coughs> fencing them through uh, the Patriarca group. If I'm sure a lot of people who are fans of this genre know that name. And so they were bringing these uh, coats down there and they were pulled over by a, uh, a patrol car with, with Adderall, North Attleboro Police in it. So I needed that report. It was, it was kind of vital to the story, as you'll see uh, when you read it. Um, so when I called the North Edinburgh Police uh, Records Clerk, I spoke with her, her name was Kathleen, um, I, I told her what I need, the date, the incident, and so forth, and she said, I'm really sorry to tell you this, Dan, I have some bad news. Um, all of our records were paper records. They were stored in cardboard boxes in our old police station. And we've since moved to a new police station. But when we were in the old station, there was a major flood. And all of those records were destroyed. I'm sorry to say that that record won't exist. Um, so I, I was disappointed. But you know, a good researcher always finds other means. And so I, I sat back and started to think of ways I could get that story. Um, a couple hours later, my phone rang. I had given Kathleen my phone number. And she said, I have some really good news for you. Uh, she said, I went down to the records office of our new police station, and out of about 200 cartons of records that were destroyed, there's one left. And my record was in it. 37 pages of pure gold. Uh, it, and it was a good report by these police officers, thankfully. It outlined the entire um, arrest, everything that was, uh, they even had prices they valued all the fur coats, and so they could come up with a number that Rocco was guilty of stealing. Um, just, just amazing that that turned up. Uh, a lot of things happened on that same vein where strange coincidences, especially early on when I was collecting a lot of the, the research data. Uh, so that's, that's one story. Um, I reached out to Rocco after about a, a year, maybe a little more, of just research. I wanted to kind of get my my information as much as I could before I saw him. Um, right around the time I turned 50, I got a, I got a, I guess you could say a birthday gift for somebody who's trying to write a book like this. Uh, I sent a letter to Rocco, asked him if I could come see him in the prison. And soon after that, my wife and I went on a trip, so we were away, and he got the letter fairly quickly and couldn't get me in there fast enough. He actually reached out to his sister, who lives in Plymouth, and gave her, um, they got hold of my phone number, and they were calling me, leaving messages, they were sending cards, trying to get me. And I was away for a little while, so when I came back, I got all these messages, and Rocco wants to see you. Right away. <laughs> so I set up my first visit, and I went up to uh, MCI Norfolk to see him. And it, it, was, it was amazing. Now, one of the things during one of our interviews that Rocco would ask me is, if I was nervous about coming into a prison, um, 
you know, like that. And I said, no, uh, in, in the early 80s, uh, I had well, my career involved being an EMT. I worked for a private ambulance service. And oddly enough, that private ambulance service um, served MCI Norfolk and MCI Walpole. So I was in and out of those places probably as much as some of the inmates. Um, and so I told them that, and uh, I said it was fairly comfortable with being in the prison. Well, one day I was checking in to go see him, one of my twice weekly visits that I did for two years. And it was really busy, a lot of confusion in the processing area where they put you through the metal detector and they do pat downs and they do all this crazy stuff to, to make sure you're not bringing anything into the facility. And one of the things they do is stamp your hand with uh, invisible ink. And then they have a black light reader where they can scan that to make sure when you're coming out that you're not one of the inmates, you know, because that's been tried. And so during a really confusing moment when I was trying to get in, um, they forgot to stamp my hand. <laughs> so I get in and I'm sitting with Rocco and we're chatting and then I realize all of a sudden, oh no. <laughs> and I said, he said, what's the matter? I said, your uh, corrections officers forgot to stamp my hand. I said, what happens now? And he just took, he smiled at me, a little bit of a giggle, and he says, we have a place for you to stay tonight, Dan. <laughs> so, uh, it's funny, I, you know, I, I spent so much time in there, I got to know the corrections officers. One of them came over to me one day while Rocco was coming down from the tier, and he sat down with me and says, I'm not going to ask you why you come in here so often. I'm kind of figuring it out. Um, but, you know, you do spend a lot of time here. And uh, most people don't like spending this time, <laughs> this much time in prisons. And I said, well, I'm meeting with this gentleman and we're having conversations and uh, let me ask you a question. I said, if I ever end up here, do I get all this for time served? <laughs> and he said, nope, you're gonna do the whole bit. <laughs> um, <clears throat> there were some other incidences that, that are pretty interesting. Uh, two more. One of them was, um, Rocco got sick. Uh, he came down with cancer. Uh, he was at MCI Norfolk at the time, and eventually they moved him to the uh, Shirley prison where they have, they have a hospital unit, and lastly at the, uh, the Shattuck Hospital in Jamaica Plain. And they also have a hospital unit that's on the eighth floor. Bars, steel doors, the whole nine yards in, in a hospital facility. It's very odd. Um, but while he was still at Norfolk and he got sick, I obviously couldn't visit him. He was in the infirmary, and there was no communications in or out of the prison. He could communicate outward by calling family members. They got 15 minutes a day. Uh, it had to be paid for. Uh, the government would charge these people, um, inmates or inmates' families, uh, a set amount of money for those phone privileges. And so Rocco could call out, but obviously if he's laid up in the hospital infirmary, he can't make any calls. So nobody knew what was going on with him. We all knew he was sick because that, that was revealed. But weeks went by where I didn't visit, we didn't talk, nothing. And you know, I had no idea. So I used to work a, um, a part-time job as an ambulance dispatcher. And I can say it now because I don't work for this company anymore, but most of this book was written on their dime. <laughs> um, you know, a paragraph between answer and phone calls. You know, what else was I going to do? You know. Um, so, anyways, I'm sitting there and you know thinking about what how I was going to find out what was going on with my friend Rocco Bolero, and I glanced up at the screen, the computer screen, and there was a call going on with Rocco Bolero in the back of the ambulance, one of our ambulances. So I set about the task of tracking down the uh, EMT's cell number. She was in the back with him. And we called, and next thing you know, I'm on the phone talking to Rocco Bolero as he's in the back of an ambulance on his way to Boston. And I got the entire rundown of what was going on with him, how his condition was, he, he had some issues, but he was, he was gonna be okay at that point. And it was, it was really good to have a conversation with him um, and, and kind of you know, get the scoop. Um, so that was a very strange coincidence. Oddly enough, I worked for that ambulance service for 25 years, and obviously I had the ability to look at previous ambulance calls. I know you're not supposed to share that information, but I could see them. And that was the first time he ever rode in one of our ambulances. Because I knew the next question was, all those times that I went into the prison 
what, did I ever take him for a ride? And like I said, I grew up with his name in my family from the age of two, and no, I, I, I might have passed him in a hallway somewhere, but no, I've never had him in the back of my ambulance. So, um, Rocco, as I got to know him, and we had our conversations, and we got more comfortable with each other, started to introduce me to his family members. And uh, he had uh, five brothers, so there were six men, six women, 12 altogether. His mother was busy. Um, there is one surviving now. The rest of them have all passed. His sister Lucy, the one who reached out to me while I was away. She, she's uh, still around. She's in her 80s. Lives on uh, Lakeside in Plymouth. Nice, la nice lady. Um, but he introduced me to his brother Billy, Billy Valero. And this guy was a character. Um, the first time I met him, Rocco set up the meeting and I was going to see him at his club in Revere. It was called the Revere Businessmen's Association, the RBA. And it was one of those places that doesn't have a sign on the front of it. So you don't know what's inside. Painted out windows. Yeah, painted out windows, exactly. Yeah. So I was living in Norwood at the time. I didn't know Revere at all. I do now, but I didn't know then. And so I got a little bit lost trying to find this place. And I walked in. And he's standing there with his arms folded across his, his chest. This big mob guy. And I walk in and I look at him and he says, you're late. <laughs> Never met this guy in my life. I said, I'm sorry, no excuses, you're late. So, um, I thought this is, this is gonna be tough actually sitting down and talking with this guy. But he had a heart of gold. He, he was amazing. Over time, um, as I got to know him, we. My wife and I, and him and his wife Linda, would actually go out for meals once a month, easily. Never let me pay. He always had a gift card. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he, he had gift cards. So. Um, he was a funny guy, you know. I, I'll remember one meal, we were sitting there, and he's, yeah. <laughs> he's coughing, he's coughing, he says, I gotta go outside and have a cigarette, I'm gonna have a heart attack. <laughs> Um, just, just a great guy. Um, so over time, we got to know each other better, and he provided a lot of the information. I mean, granted, the research, most of my research was on my own at assorted libraries, um, and Rocco himself. Rocco used to send me reams of stacks of documents, newspaper articles, um, affidavits, court documents, testimony, you name it. I, it, it took me forever to go through this stuff, and uh, it was it was pretty amazing. And it proved what he what he said. That, along with my discussions with a number of attorneys and police officers, I had affidavits from police officers that that matched his story. Everything was corroborated. Um, I don't want to give away the actual night of the the incident because that's the whole book revolves around that. I'll leave that to you. Uh, but I'll get back to Billy. Billy Billy's an interesting character. I took him, uh, when Rocco was on his last leg and he was at the Shirley, I, I took the family members one by one up to visit him, kind of a last visit. Uh, they were elderly, long drive, so I, I volunteered, and each one I would take back and forth. And the ride with Billy was in traffic, so we had quite a while together, and we had a great conversation. I said, look, Billy, can I? He told me things that I couldn't say then when he was still alive. He told me about some of his bank robbery escapades. Um, you know, I, I, I asked him, I said, Billy, can I ask you, did you, did you ever kill anybody? And he says, yeah, five. <laughs> and I'm like, five? I, I said, you know, you're a thief, you're not a hit man. He says, yeah, but I fought in the Korean War. They were, I, I killed five Chinese guys. <laughs> and I corroborated that too, he did. I, I, tracked down the records and he had, he had all the medals to prove it. So, so we'd be driving along and he'd be telling me all these uh, great stories. And I said, well, I have one for you, Billy. He says, oh yeah, what's that? I said, well, it could be an urban myth, but I saw it in somebody's blog on the internet. He says, all right, go ahead, go ahead, tell me about it. All right, so in 1963, him and his brothers opened up a club in the, in the combat zone. Anybody know the combat zone? Yeah. Okay. It was called the Intermission Lounge. It's actually still there. It's a restaurant now. Uh, but in the 60s, it was a little bit different. <laughs> uh, so him and his brothers opened that, and they had a great band. They were awesome. They were called Roger Pace. And Roger was soft jazz, 
and really popular. A lot of people would come in to see Roger. And one of the other clubs up the street in the zone managed to lure Roger away with more money. And so Roger left, and Billy got upset and went to visit the owner of the other club. And he said to him, um, I want Roger back at the intermission lounge immediately. And the other club owner said, screw you, Valero. Get the hell out of my club. Is that your final answer? He goes outside to his car. He gets a, a shotgun. And he locates the other uh, owner's car. He's parked in an alleyway. Nice Cadillac. And he killed the car. He shot it. Shot the block, shot everything. The cow was useless after that. Just blew it away. So I'm telling this story, and Billy's sitting next to me in the passenger seat, and I said, so Billy, urban myth or truth? He didn't say anything. I looked over at him, smiling ear to ear. <laughs> you know, so, so later on, in our, as we got to know each other even better, he comes to me one day, and he says, Dan, I want you to meet somebody special. And I said, okay, who is it? It's a surprise. Well, aren't you going to tell me who it is? It's an effing surprise. <laughs> okay, so I was patient. We ended up meeting at Antonio's restaurant on Cambridge Street in Boston. It's right across the street from the Mass General. And we sit down. And so I'm, I'm just enjoying my appetizer and talking small talk with Billy. And now, obviously, at this point in, in, in the research, I knew what all the gangsters looked like. I had pictures of every one of them. I knew who, who was who. And coming in the door with a couple of big guys behind him was this little old man who I recognized as Peter Lamont. Now, at the time, Peter Lamont was uh, uh, the head of La Cosa Nostra, the head of the mafia in New England, for about two years after he got out of prison. He was there for 33 years, and then he got out, and he ran the mafia for a little while. And I'm like, no, oh my God, that's Peter Lamont. He says, stand up, stand up. So I stood up, and Mr. Lamont comes over to me, and I reach out to shake his hand, and he hugs me and gives me an Italian kiss, one on each cheek. And he says, come on, sit down, sit down, let's, let's talk. And we're chatting, and I'm, I'm sitting here, and I'm thinking to myself, I'm Dan Zimmerman. I, I work for an ambulance company. I live in Norwood. And I'm sitting here with the head of the mafia, having apple pie. There's something not right about this. Great country, you guys. Yeah, it really is a great country. So we talked, and I grew more comfortable, and Mr. Lamont was kind enough to give me um, information about Rocco, time they spent together incarcerated at MCI Walpole, some great stories, and every time he would tell me a story, every time he would share one, I would ask him, can I use that in my book? Oh yeah, oh yeah, do it, do it. So as, we, as he was leaving here to go, um, he stood up and he said the typical line that I heard probably three or four times over the course of this, Dan, any friend of Rocco is a friend of ours. If there's anything you should ever need, you call me first. And I said, Mr. Lamone, is there anything I can do for you? He says, yeah. When you have your book signing, you're first. I want to be first in line, even ahead of your family. He says, but I'll buy 25 copies. <laughs> so great guy, uh, really great, tough story. He, he spent 33 years in jail for a murder he did not commit. He was framed by the FBI. Um, and. Uh, Kind of sad, but happy guy, because when he got out, they sued the government, and they won $25 million. So in his last years, he did pass away recently. In his last years, he built a beautiful house in Medford. Uh, his family gets to enjoy that money now. Uh, your tax dollars. Uh, but, you know, good guy, good stories. And uh, I was glad to meet him. I was actually glad to meet him. Uh, the last one I'll, I'll share, and this is in the book. Um, was Rocco's eulogy. Uh, when, he, when he passed away, his family came, approached me and they asked me if I would mind doing his eulogy. <laughs> you know, it was an offer I couldn't refuse. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> sorry. Um, but I wrote the eulogy and here we are at St. Anthony's Church in Revere. 
uh, I'm up at the podium, and I look out at the audience. Friends, family, gangsters, <laughs> ex-cons, police officers, you name it, they're all there. Um, but one of the things they discovered during the course of my eulogy was that Rocco did not die alone. Um, he, he feared that. He feared dying in prison. Uh, he once told me when he was at Norfolk that uh, he, did a, he worked in the morgue for a stretch of time. And he says, Dan, I don't know how I'm going to pull this off, but there's no way I'm going to let them put my body in that place. I said, well, Rocco, I don't think you have much choice. But, um, he actually succeeded. He ended up at the Shattuck, and that's where he passed away. And he passed away with friends. Uh, my wife and I were at bedside when he, when he passed away. Uh, the family, his family, didn't know that. They had no idea. I didn't just call them up and say, hey, by the way, we were sitting there when Rocco died. We kept it to ourselves until the time of the eulogy, and I added it. And shocked faces, after it was over with, they all came over to me and thanked me. And they were so happy to hear that he had he had friends, people with him when he passed away. Um, we went back to the RBA afterwards. This was interesting. For a bite to eat, a couple of drinks. Um, my wife and I were sitting at the bar, and Billy Bolero comes over. He owned the place, and he puts his arm around each of our shoulders, and he said, look. He says, we're drinking here, and I lost my liquor license. He says, I'm guessing that neither one of you have been arrested. No, we haven't. He says, all right, so. If the cops come in the front door, I want you to screw out the back door. <laughs> the so they were, I walked over to get a plate of food. Now earlier at the church, we, um, we, my wife and I were standing in the lobby, kind of looking over the audience, people that were going to be there. And we saw this guy, he's standing there, he's huge. He looked like Tony Soprano. Same look. The tight shirt, the jacket, the shiny shoes, the whole nine yards. And he had a little entourage circle, circled around him, and he's chatting with him. We're, we're both like, you know, who's that? It's got to be somebody. So, after the funeral and back at the RBA, I'm walking back with a plate of food and I, I feel a hand on my shoulder. It's a big hand. And I turn around and it's a, that guy. And he, I, I say, can I help you? <laughs> a little stutter, but he says, yeah. My name's Phil Popolo. I'm a very good friend of Rocco Valeros. And what you did for him, we can't thank you enough for that. So I want you to take down my number and make sure if you ever should need anything, you call me first. So as soon as I get home, I'm on the computer. <laughs> Phil Popolo, extortion, racketeering, <laughs> beating up people for money, the whole, <laughs> you name it, he did it. So it was funny. But one, one last thing at the, at the, uh, the after dinner, um, we're sitting back at the bar again, and in comes a photographer. The family had hired a photographer. They had kind of a tradition that when somebody in the family died, they took a picture of the remaining Valero clan. I thought it was kind of a little bit odd, but, you know, people do things. And so we're sitting there, and I'm kind of observing this. And all of a sudden, I hear Billy Valero yell, Dan, Mary, get your asses over here. We want you in the picture. I have pictures of myself surrounded by a mafia family. <laughs> and as I'm walking back to the bar for the last time, one of the nephews comes over to me and says, Hey, Dan, how's it feel to be on the FBI bulletin board? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I hope you enjoyed those stories. Now, now that I've talked myself out, I'm going to open it up to any questions you folks may have. Yes, ma'am. They contacted you when he was dying and not his family? Yes. I was on the list as the number one contact. His family, like I said earlier, was kind of on the elderly side. Yeah. Um, not a lot of cell phones in the mix. T difficult, you know, difficult to reach. So uh, my wife and I offered ourselves up, and the family agreed to that. They said, you know, and so I got a call from uh, the physician um, to let us know it was 8:15 on a night in January, cold night in January. Uh, yeah. So we were we were the number one contact, and. I actually chose, we decided not to, it was maybe 9 o'clock at night, it wasn't too late, but I chose not to call the rest of the family until the next day. It was re really wasn't something I had to wake people up or ring phones in the middle of the night. And so we called the next day to let them all know. And, uh, <coughs> anyone else? Yes, Mike. Danny, you said that growing up, 
Yes. You heard all the stories, you know, your family characterized him as a monster. Yes. Um, and then you got to know him and found out they were wrong. Yes. I'm curious, after your book and all your research, were you able I to convince... I see this question coming yeah, out were, were you able to convince your family as such, or do they still feel that way, and have you been ostracized at all for embracing him? Yes and no. Um, two of the principal people that I interviewed um, were my uncle, who was my Aunt Toby's brother, obviously, and my father, who was her brother. Um, at the time, um, my uncle was a little bit concerned about the questions I was going to ask, but I kept it gentle. And my father said to me when I first approached him with the idea that I was going to write this book and I could use his help, said, I prefer to leave, let uh, sleeping dogs lie. But if you feel strongly about it, I'll help you. <clears throat> Keep in mind, both of them thought I was going to write the cold-blooded killer story. Um, one of the things that happened after Rocco passed away is the Bolero family decided to add my wife and I to his eulogy for everyone to see, including dear old dad. And uh, he was of the the belief that what I, the story I had to tell was not the accurate one. He was one of the very, very few. In fact, I can count on one hand how many people disagree. And that's only because it's ingrained in them. There was so many years that had gone by that they believed that X happened when in fact it was Y. And no matter what I did, I couldn't convince them. They were just too stubborn to, to listen, to listen to reason. My uncle, Toby's brother, I turned him. He still uptight about talking about it when we chat, when we meet for lunch and we have a, it, it comes up in the conversation. He's still a little bit uptight about it, but I did turn him. He, and I, I provided whatever he wanted. I said, look, I'm, I want to give you some documents. I want to give you a couple of these affidavits. Read them and tell me. And over time, he actually was on board and he provided quite a bit of uh, information for me. Uh, my, my aunt's um, yearbook was huge. Uh, a, a diary. There were entries in this diary that it was stunning to read. And these are things that if I hadn't been able to convince him of my beliefs and the evidence, uh, he might never have come forward and helped me as much as he did. So I appreciate that. Yes, ma'am. Um, when you first started, did you, you thought that he was guilty? Yes. And you found that oh, through your research that he wasn't? Yes. Uh, how, yeah. long, how long? Before? Three weeks. It only took three weeks. Three weeks of twice weekly visits. And then so, so about six visits, two hours a piece, 12 hours. And then just from what he said? To yes, you? and then what I did is my, my research, I began to find things to corroborate oh, okay. the story he had to tell. I didn't just go in there and have Rocco Bolero throw an arm around my shoulder and right. have him tell me, I didn't kill your aunt, I loved her. Right. Um, I wanted to make sure that I was doing the right thing. At what point did you fully believe that it was very early. It was very early. Yeah, a um, couple of the documents. The first documents that he sent me when he started to send out stuff were um, court affidavits from uh, investigating detectives. Uh, Sergeant Detective Matthew King was instrumental in uh, basically laying the blame on others, not Rocco. He agreed that it wasn't Rocco that fired the, the deadly bullets. It was actually uh, police officers. Not intentionally. Yes, ma'am? Um, was he in jail for those murders? Is that what uh, he was yes. serving time for? Yes. And why was there not a retrial? If it there was. was. There was. Okay. There was. What took place, um, he, he was tried and convicted along with two associates that were with him the night of the shootings. Um, initially, they were uh, found guilty and sentenced to death. Huh? In 1963, the death penalty was still existed in Massachusetts. Uh, that was later overturned when they got rid of the death penalty, but he remained in for life. And the reason he remained in for life was during one of the appeal approaches, his attorney, who happened to be his cousin and was young and inexperienced, made a deal with the judge that if Rocco were to plead guilty to first degree murder, that his brother and the third gentleman would go free after just 10 years on a manslaughter charge. And Rocco pushed back. He didn't want to agree with that. It was a bad deal. Uh, I talked to one attorney in Boston, and I said, how is it in those days 
to plead guilty to first degree murder, what, what's, what wheels get set in motion? He says, I'll, I'll draw a scenario for you, Dan. He says, you always plead innocent or not guilty to first degree murder charges. At least try, make them work for it. Don't just hand it to them. And he says, if, you know, I'll, I'll draw a picture for you. You're standing in a gymnasium with a gun. There's a guy standing there and you're about to shoot him. There are a hundred people circled around you and they're all taking pictures of you do it. And when you get into court, you tell them, not guilty. That's how you just don't admit it. Because once you admit it, you're done for. And Rocco, under coercion from his family members, um, feeling that it was his fault that his brother got dragged into this, and his brother had a new baby, uh, Rocco agreed to the deal. They get out in 10 years, uh, he stayed in forever. Um, the only time he got out of uh, prison after that, he had escaped twice prior to the night of the shootings. He was very good with a hacksaw blade, um, as he proved. Very good with a hacksaw blade. Um, but the only time he escaped after the trial and after being convicted was uh, he walked away from a work detail um, and, and ended up with friends in San Francisco. And eventually they tracked him down and brought him back. Uh, but that was his only time. There were times prior to that in the late 70s. Everybody remember Governor Dukakis? Well, one of the good things that he did was for inmates in prisons, he set up, he set up a program called the furlough program. And it allowed long-term inmates who had shown that they were well-behaved and doing the right thing to go out, actually leave the prisons on the weekends, go visit family. Rocco went to his brother's wedding um, and then returned. Basically, they were inmates Monday through Friday. You know, it was like a job. Um, but then uh, word came down from some people that were concerned that crimes would be committed during these furloughs and the pressure was on to stop the program. And Rocco got wind of that and was upset and decided to leave. <laughs> and he left. Uh, he was gone for a few months. Spent some time out on the West Coast. Admired the Golden Gate Bridge. Mm -hmm. Saved the two-year-old girl from drowning. Um, yeah. Yes, Mike. Did, did they ever, um, in the retrial, or anything, I mean, with today's scientific evidence, it just seems like a no-brainer. Yeah. Exhume the bodies and look at the bullets. Um, my aunt, the bullet in her, she was shot in the head. The bullet was so badly fragmented, they couldn't do anything ballistics-wise. And my cousin, who was two, was all of 40 pounds soaking wet. The bullet that hit him in the abdomen was a pass-through. Gotcha. So, and they found, uh, during the shootout that took place, they found 40 bullets in the walls. Some police bullets, some Rocco bullets. Um, yes? Um, why did you carry out with this book for so long? Like, was it, because you, you said you did so many years of research, and... Why did it take me so long to write it? No, no. Why <laughs> my, my wife will answer that question. <laughs> <laughs> Why did you carry on with it um, as if it was like you were doing? I wanted to see the good in people, or did you want to try and prove something? I wanted to, it was twofold. I wanted to tell Rocco's story. Rocco actually wanted to tell the story. Uh, I was his his voice. I was his mouthpiece. Um, a lot of what you see in this book, besides the quotes, the things that he said himself, um, I took the time to write it, send it to him during a correspondence between us, and get his approval. Do you like how I did this? And he would say, yes, it's perfect. Or no, I, I don't like this line. He would actually be my pre-publishing editor. Um, as a matter of fact, the photo on the cover, now everybody would agree that Rocco looks a little gangsterish, if that's a word. He looks tough. And when the book came out, his sister Lucy called me and she said, Dan, why did you use that picture? We have so many pictures of Rocco who looks, he's, he's smiling, he's happy. Why, why couldn't she use one of those? I said, Lucy, your brother wanted this picture on the cover. He wanted this picture. This is what he chose. You got to keep that in mind. I, I mean, it's it's perfect. <laughs> you have to you have to admit it's a perfect picture for the story. Um, the other thing we tried, in addition to writing and researching this book, 
we tried to get Rocco a commutation. We tried to get him out um, during his late years. After, after he was diagnosed with cancer, we tried to push a medical release uh, so that said he could get out and spend some time on the outside of the walls before he passed away. His sister Lucy has a huge house on, on a lake in Plymouth and she had room for him. He would envision, when we talked about it, he would envision sitting in a boat and reading a book and just floating around on the water. And, you know, simple things like that. Um, but the, the, the government in Massachusetts is very, very difficult. Uh, the commutation reached uh, the governor's desk and it was denied. Um, and then, soon after that, a group of senators, uh, headed up by a woman named Patricia Jalen, um, actually drafted a bill to get uh, early medical release for inmates who were sick and terminal cancer, whatever it may be, to get them out early so they can spend some time with their families. And uh, they actually went to visit. Rocco was one of their in uh, people they interviewed at the uh, at the prison hospital they interviewed him. And there was hope that this bill would pass in the, in the state house and that some of these, these people would get an opportunity to be outside and uh, the bill failed, they voted it down. So, so there, was a, there were a lot of things happening as far as Rocco personally, along with the book, to tell his story. Kurt. When you first started to, your research to want to go see Rocco and you wrote to him, did you tell him, hi, my name is Dan Zimmerman, you yeah, that, that are in prison for allegedly killing my aunt? How yeah. did you approach that? It was a simple letter. It was only a couple paragraphs. I didn't want to delve too deeply into it because I was afraid I'd scare him off. Quite the, quite the contrary. He, he basically had me dragged in there. Um, Little funny story. Uh, Rocco had been approached by a number of writers to do this story, and he turned them all down. He wanted the right person, and when he discovered me, the fact that I'm a relative of the of the victim, the woman that he loved, it, it, it was a done deal. When I first met him, I was sitting in the visiting room in MCI Norfolk, and he comes through this opening after his processing, and obviously I knew what he looked like. He didn't know what I looked like. So I stood up and put my hand up to let him know who I was. And he comes over to me, and I reach out my hand to shake it, shake his hand, and he throws his arms around me and gives me a big hug. And he says, I can't believe it, standing right in front of me, Toby's DNA. <laughs> I've been called a lot of things, but, <laughs> but DNA. And, you know, the corrections officer quickly ran over and separated us because you're not supposed to have that kind of contact. But um, yeah, he, I, I was his. I became his mouthpiece, and he trusted me because I was a relative of, of his beloved Toby and and, and Mark. Um, you know, I've done all the side things, the little things you don't have to do for for a book. I went to visit my aunt's gravesite. She's in a grave in uh, Everett. And Mark is in a pauper's field in West Roxbury. Um, they were separated at death uh, by the fam by my family. Uh, one of the reasons was that Toby was Jewish, and she was buried in a Jewish cemetery. And Mark was not. He was uh, baptized Catholic. And uh, those rules back in the early 60s were very strict about burying non-Jewish people in the cemetery. So they separated by uh, by about 10 minutes. That's fine. Well, we also had a daughter, correct? She did. She did. What's your relationship? The daughter was six months old. Real quick side story on uh, uh, Bernice. Um, one of those other things that I did not have to do, but I did. Are we getting close? Yeah. I'll tell this real story real quick. Because okay? um, it is interesting. Um, Bernice obviously didn't play a huge role in the story. She was six months old. She survived the shootings, obviously, um, and she went on. No, nobody in the family, whether it was her father's family or my family, had the means to adopt her. So she was adopted by, by a, a family in uh, Canton and raised there. Here's where, here's where it gets crazy. She's my first cousin, obviously. Uh, didn't know who she was, where she was, what she was doing. So. When I tracked, I tracked her down. I took the time to track her down. Even though I didn't have to, there was no interview there. 
I wanted to, a curiosity, where is she? What happened to her? So through fam, uh, Children's and Family Division of Boston, I got some help from a social worker there and she helped me find her. We ultimately communicated after a couple of months, talked on the phone. And come to find out, she grew up in Canton. I grew up in Norwood, literally three or four miles apart. She went to school to become a nurse. I went to school to become an EMT. She worked at the Norwood Hospital emergency room. I brought patients into the Norwood Hospital emergency room. And I said to her, I said, can I ask you what you looked like? She said, yeah. I guess I'm kind of attractive and I'm blonde. I'm like, oh my God. I didn't like ask you out on a date or anything. She said, no, I would have remembered that. Just one of those small coincidences. But the, the worst part about it was she, um, she lost her mother, Toby, in these shootings. She got adopted. Her adopted mother um, was taking her out for some, some cancer treatments and driving back to, to their home in Canton, they encountered something some of you might remember. It's called the blizzard of 78. And their car got stuck on Access Road down by the Norwood Airport. It was over, overrun by snow, the exhaust pipe filled, and they smothered to death. So this girl, and she was 16 at the time, this girl lost two mothers, both tragic. And, but she's okay today. She okay with the love care? No. She's one of the other people that's on my end. Uh, she she doesn't agree. So. Do you still keep up with the family? Uh, the the Bolero family. Yes. A lot of them are gone. I talk with Lucy. I talk with some of the uh, nephews and nieces. Yes. Uh, as a matter of fact, when the book came out and it hit Facebook, and people started to buy it, some of the relatives that I didn't know about it have been calling me. So far, it's all good. <laughs> no yeah. contract. Yeah, no, no. Every, everybody's been happy with what I had to say. So I didn't want to. I didn't want to upset any of the Bolero clan that spent too much time developing that relationship. Yeah. So. Um, when, when you were writing the book, not the question book, you were writing the book. Yeah. I can attest to how much time you actually spent. On the book. <laughs> I sat next to you many nights while you were on the clock. A paragon? Yeah. I admitted that, Dave, I was on the clock at AMR Ambulance, and I can say it now because they're no longer in business and they can't come after me. But it was a paragraph, literally, for seven to eight years, a paragraph at a time in between calls. calls. But the book is 450 pages? Yes. You wrote at least 450 just in shifts we were. <laughs> the question, the question just, is, did they, did, yes. did they have to edit a lot down yes. or did it hurt? Yes. The, it, the original edition, the, the finished product that I had was 600 pages. And I knew that was too long. I, I write long. Those of you who read the book, you'll see that I write long. Um, so they asked me to reduce it. Um, it was a huge battle between me and two editors, <coughs> two female editors. A lot of ugly discussion, mostly by email, thankfully, because some of the words weren't pleasant. And it, when push came to shove, I was getting upset about some of the things they wanted me to cut out. The story about Billy Bolero in the intermission lounge that I told you folks. Yeah. The editor thought that didn't have anything, any meaning for the story. I'm like, that's a great story. It's got to stay. Meeting Peter Lamont, they suggested I take that out as well. And I wouldn't do it. So I called the publisher. I said, look, we're going to put up a shut up right now. I said, I've been dealing with your editors. Uh, I don't like them. Um, I, will cut, <laughs> I will cut down the book myself to a reasonable length. And let's publish. And he finally... He was so frustrated with me, he said, you know what, fine, <laughs> it's your book, just, just go with it. So I got it down to 450 without really cutting anything important. It was just a lot of fluff, I admit that. You know, so. You did it. It was worth the wait. Thank you, yeah, I appreciate it. You know. And I appreciate everybody coming out tonight. Thank you. So, yeah, I'm on my book number two, I don't want to divulge too much, uh, I can tell you, um, there was a, uh, some of you would remember, back in the early 80s, there was a, uh, an incident where some Everett and Chelsea police officers stormed a hotel room and ended up... Uh, King Arthur's Court? King Arthur's, yes. Oh, and they, wow. Yeah, the place is no longer there. It's now part of the Wynn Casino complex. But the stories remain. And trust me, uh, it's, 
It's going to be fun to write, and it's going to be scary to write. And the reason it's going to be scary to write is, and I talked to my friend out in the West Coast, Johnny Saron, we were discussing it. And he says, Dan, you can't write that book. And I said, why? He says, he says that it's dangerous. And this is a gangster telling me this, right? And I said, well, I, Johnny, I just finished writing a book where I was sitting at dinner with the head of the mafia and other gangsters. He says, yeah, but those are cops. <laughs> so, but I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it. I'm um, giving myself 18 months. It won't be seven years, because I don't know if I'll be around that long. <laughs> so, but thank you again. Um, if you, I know a lot of people already grabbed the books in, in my signature. Um, any proceeds from these books uh, going to the uh, Mello family here in um, North Reading there, down on that lock. Uh, young woman with two young artistic daughters, and uh, I guess her house is in, in jeopardy. So my wife and I decided that uh, any books sold tonight, we turn the proceeds over to them. And uh, they have a GoFundMe page, and that's what we're going to do. So thank you for those who have uh, purchased. And uh, again, thanks for coming out tonight. I appreciate it.